Hey, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this session on bin packing pods in managed Kubernetes. Thank you for being here. I'm Vinay Surya Devara, and I'm a senior software engineer at ClickHouse. Uh, my co-presenter is Jan Fei Hu. He also works as a senior software engineer at ClickHouse. So on the agenda today, um, we'll start with a short introduction to what is ClickHouse and ClickHouse Cloud. Then we'll talk about the like, uh, overview of the problem that we are facing with our infrastructure and why we used bin packing to solve it. Uh, then we'll get into the de details of what is our, how our infrastructure is set up, what were the various approaches we used to solve our node utilization problem. And then we'll also talk about like, the rollout we did for our, across our fleet, uh, what were the savings we achieved, and some of the learnings uh, that we realized uh, during this whole exercise. Uh, and then we'll end with Q&A at the end, very end. So what is ClickHouse? ClickHouse is an OLAP database. Uh, it's used mainly for analytics use cases. Uh, it's used to generate aggregations and visualizations on your data. Uh, and it works best with mostly immutable data. It's been in development since 2009, and it was open sourced in 2016, and it's gained a lot of popularity since then, and it's one of the fastest growing GitHub communities. ClickHouse is a fully distributed database, so it supports replication, sharding, uh, multi-master, and cross-region setup, so it is production ready. Last and the most important thing about ClickHouse is that it is extremely fast. Using various techniques such as column-oriented storage and state-of-the-art data compression, ClickHouse provides insights into uh, the customer data in milliseconds, which makes it one of the fastest databases out there. So now that we have an idea about what is ClickHouse, what is ClickHouse Cloud? So ClickHouse Cloud is the serverless offering of ClickHouse. Uh, it has various features such as idling and auto-scaling so that you can bring down your compute when, there are no, uh, when there's no activity on the cluster, and similarly auto-scale auto uh, the cluster when there are workload spikes. We also have compute and storage separation so that you can scale compute independently of storage. This is how a ClickHouse Cloud instance looks under the hood. We use Kubernetes as a compute layer, and we use object storage uh, for the data persistence. Um, we currently still use PVCs for some metadata, but we are in the process of moving away from that. We're currently available on AWS and GCP, uh, and pretty soon we'll be coming to Azure as well. And later in the year, we'll also have the Bring Your Own Cloud offering in which the customer data can stay in the customer um, VPC and customer cloud account, and they can use the ClickHouse Cloud control plane to deploy ClickHouse in their account so that uh, large enterprises uh, who do not want to part with the data can use this solution to deploy ClickHouse on their premises. So now that we have an idea about what is ClickHouse and what is ClickHouse Cloud, what is the problem that we were trying to solve? And before we get into the problem, the title of the talk is Bin Packing Pods in Managed Kubernetes. So what is bin packing? In general terms, bin packing is an optimization problem in which items of different sizes must be packed into a finite number of bins, each with a given capacity, in a way that minimizes the number of bins used. So if you look at this picture, uh, on the left side, you see that we have an initial set of objects that individually have some weights. And on the right, we have uh, bins with max capacity. And using bin packing, we can fit all of these elements in only three nodes instead of four, saving us the cost of one of those bins. Specifically in Kubernetes, bin packing refers to the process of efficiently scheduling pods onto the nodes in the cluster um, I mean, in a way to maximize the resource utilization and minimize the number of nodes needed while also satisfying all of the constraints of the pods. This helps us save uh, cluster resources such as CPU memory and can lead to a lot of cost savings and improved efficiency. So now that we have an idea of what has been packing, uh, what is the problem that we were facing? So in our cluster, in our Kubernetes clusters, which is multi-tenant and is present, are present in multiple regions, we noticed that the node resource utilization, CPU and memory, were non-optimal across the fleet. And this meant that we had higher infrastructure costs because we were running more nodes than was required. So we explored a few different solutions. And the one that we finally settled on was to update the Kubernetes scheduler scoring strategy to bin pack pods onto the fewer nodes. Then we had to roll out this solution to all of our Kubernetes clusters, which are present in multiple regions. Uh, and also, it's a multi-tenant feed, uh, so that we have multiple instance, ClickHouse instances on the same node. 
So we had to find a way to reliably roll out these changes so that existing customers do not face any disruptions. So we'll talk about all of these in detail in the coming, uh, coming sections. Um, so before we take a look at the infrastructure setup for ClickHouse Cloud, uh, some of the terminology that we'll be reusing across our slides. ClickHouse Keeper is our replacement to ZooKeeper. It is used as a coordination component for our server pods. ClickHouse Server, is, these are the compute pods for ingest and uh, query. Uh, these are the pods which process the data and process them to the object storage. ClickHouse Instance or Cluster just means that this is a custom resource in Kubernetes that consists of Keeper and Server stateful sets. Both ClickHouse Keeper and ClickHouse Server have similar needs with respect to bin packing. And so we, for the purposes of this talk, we'll only focus on the server pods for simplicity, but all of the uh, approaches that we used for the server pods can also be transferred to the Keeper pods. When we refer to a node, we just refer to an EC2, Azure, or a GCP VM. Node utilization. So when we say new node utilization, it means it's the sum of resource request of all pods on the node divided by the allocatable resources on the node. The key thing to note is that we are not looking at the actual usage of the pod, but the resource request, which is the minimum resources required by the pod. And finally, cube scheduler is the default pod scheduler for all the pods in the Kubernetes cluster. So let's take a look at how we set up uh, Kubernetes in ClickHouse Cloud. We use managed cloud, uh, Kubernetes in each cloud service provider, so EKS for AWS, GKE for GCP, and AKS for Azure. We run multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters, and what this means is that pods from two different ClickHouse instances can run on the same node. We also use namespaces for isolation so that pods from two different instances do not interfere with each other, and we use Kubernetes network policy via the Cilium CNI solution to prevent cross namespace network calls. So continuing further, we use cluster autoscaler, which is a pretty well-known component for dynamic node provisioning, so for node scale up and scale down. Uh, most of the ClickHouse server pods are in a similar shape in terms of CPU to memory ratio, and so we have a homogeneous workload for the ClickHouse server node groups. We also make use of over-provisioning, which is a concept in Kubernetes where we reserve some extra capacity for workload spikes so that when these spikes come in, uh, server pods can be scheduled on these extra nodes. And we do this by uh, scheduling some low-priority preemptable pods on these nodes, which can be evicted if server pods need to be scheduled. And these evicted pods now will tell cluster order scaler to provision more nodes for buffer. And lastly, we have a weekly release schedule for all of the pods in ClickHouse across our fleet. Um, this is important because it will come up later, and we do periodic rescheduling and restarting of pods. So we deliver all the ClickHouse image updates via this weekly release schedule. So this is how a sample Kubernetes cluster would look like. Uh, we have nodes, which are VMs, in all three AZs, uh, because ClickHouse instance has pods in all three AZs for reliability. We also have a few system workloads that are deployed on these pods so that um, we can monitor the usage on these pods. We have a few ClickHouse server pods that are already running on the nodes, and we have an operator in the, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster that is responsible for managing the custom resources. So when a new ClickHouse instance is created, it creates a custom resource which is managed by the operator and which in turn creates stateful sets, and the stateful sets create the pods that they manage. Similarly, when another custom resource, uh, when another ClickHouse instance is created, the same process is repeated and the pods are created again. And we see that uh, pods from two different instances are living on the same node. This is what we meant by multi-tenant. So this is how like, the infrastructure would look like in a Kubernetes cluster in ClickHouse Cloud. So now that we have an idea about how our infrastructure looks like, what is the problem that we were running into? So when we did a regular audit of our fleet, we noticed that the node utilization in the fleet was only about 40 to 60%. And this was bad because it meant we were running nearly twice the number of nodes we needed to run the same workloads. So a few factors in our cloud setup that contribute to utilization. Uh, we have a dynamic fleet, which means that since we have idling enabled, ClickHouse clusters, which do not have any queries or inserts running on them uh, for more than 30 minutes, are now scaled down to zero pods. 
We also have auto scaling. That means pods might occasionally need to be restarted with a different size and a different uh, CPU and memory. And finally, in the regular service lifecycle in creation and termination, we have pods being provisioned and pods being uh, deprovisioned as well. And all this means that utilization is something that ch keeps changing over time and is quite dynamic within our Kubernetes clusters. So the goal, which after identifying the problem, the main goal for us is to increase the node resource utilization across the fleet and via that we can realize some cost savings. So we explored a few approaches to um, improving the node utilization. But before we talk about the approaches, any solution that we actually adopt needs to satisfy a few requirements. The first and the most obvious one is that it needs to increase the node resource utilization across the fleet. The second and the most important one is that for existing customers, we want to minimize disruption to their workloads. Since we're a database, we might have long running insert queries on pods that we do not want to interrupt. And we also do not want any degradation in the experience for customers when they're provisioning new instances. Since now we have fewer nodes in the, uh, in the cluster, we do not want the node provisioning time to be an additional burden for the customers. And the last requirement is that our solution needs to be multi-cloud friendly. Since we run in three major clouds, uh, we want one solution that works for all three of them and not a bespoke solution for each cloud. So those are the requirements that any solution that we adopt should satisfy. So let's take a look at what are the different approaches we uh, explored. The first one was over committing the resources on the node. So in this case, um, we set the resource requests to be less than the limits of that node. And this means that the pods of, on the, of the pod, uh, this means that the pods will be QoS burstable, which means that their usage can vary from anywhere from the resource request to the resource limit. By decreasing the resource request, which is the minimum amount of resources required by the pods, uh, we can schedule more pods on each node. The key assumption here is that not all the pods use these resources up to the limits at the same time, and hence we schedule more pods on each node. So looking, looking at an example of how this would work, let's say we have a node with 64 GB total memory, and we have four pods with resource requests of 16 GB each and memory limits of 32 GB each. So now on this board, we can on this node, we can schedule four of these pods, um, and when they only use up, up to their resource requests, everything's good. But technically, if you look at the limits, we've committed 128 GB on this uh, node, which, is, which only has 64 GB. And if all the pods start using up to their maximum limits at the same time, then that's gonna cause issues. And for that very reason, we did not end up uh, adopting this approach. And like I mentioned, if all the pods start using the maximum resources, it can either, in case of memory, lead to um kill, or it can lead to throttling of the CPU. And this is not good for us, because in Tikhouse Cloud, we have a QoS guaranteed setup, because the customer sets the resource limits, and we guarantee that they get what they paid for. And so if we change that to QoS burstable, um, it will not be a good experience for the customer, and it can lead to the noisy neighbor situation. The second approach that we explored was tuning the cluster autoscaler. So cluster autoscaler has a setting where we can specify the utilization threshold. And if on a certain node, utilization falls below that threshold, then the pods on that node are evicted and that node is marked for scale down. So it doesn't mean that scale down happens immediately. Uh, it considers various things as pod disruption, budget, tains, tolerations, et cetera. It's just marked as a candidate for scale down. And this is a very handy way to identify excess capacity in the cluster. But we didn't end up adopting this approach. And the reason uh, is that this violates some of our requirements. Uh, frequent evictions of pods on nodes is too disruptive uh, for stateful workloads such as ClickHouse, uh, which is a database. It also violates our requirement of not interrupting long-running queries on these pods. And we also do not have enough fine-grained control on evictions. So we looked at another component called Descheduler, which is a Kubernetes 6 project. Uh, it's meant to be a counterpart to Kubescheduler, where when Kubescheduler makes a decision it, uh, on where, where to schedule a pod, it looks at the state of the system at a certain point in time, and it picks the best node for that pod. But the state of the system varies over time, and after a certain point, the original scheduling decision might not be valid. Uh, and, but Kube Scheduler does not go back and reschedule the pod. 
And this is where the scheduler comes in. So the scheduler can look at certain constraints that we give via, via plugins, and it can evict pods on nodes which violate those constraints. One such constraint or uh, plugin is the high node utilization plugin, using which we can set a certain threshold in the node, and if the uh, usage threshold falls below that for that particular node, the pods there are evicted. So you can see that this is actually quite similar to the cluster autoscaler, and this solution also does not work for us for the same reasons, where it's, uh, we have frequent evictions and we have uh, interruption of long-running queries. So we noticed that we had the same problem with both approaches two and three, where we are focusing on evicting the pods and scaling down the nodes, but not focusing on where the evicted pods are being scheduled. And if they go, just go on to another lesser utilized node, we are back at the same uh, problem again. And they also have frequent evictions of pod, which I already mentioned. So we decided to focus on optimizing packing during the pod scheduling phase instead of uh, thinking about evictions. So we started looking into the Kubernetes scheduler a bit more deeply. And we noticed that the way that Kubernetes scheduler does scheduling right now, it first identifies all the nodes that this pod can fit on. And then it does the scoring phase for these nodes where it picks the node best node based on the highest score. And by default, um, the least allocated scoring policy is used. And that means that when there are two pods that, uh, like there are two nodes that a pod can be scheduled on, Kubernetes will pick, uh, the cube scheduler will pick the node with the least allocation. So it does this so that it can evenly distribute the load across the cluster. But the flip side of this is that this makes node scale down unlikely because all the nodes have a certain amount of threshold and cluster autoscaler cannot reclaim the nodes. And so we have an inefficient cluster with higher number of nodes than required. So in the same vein, uh, in Kubernetes scheduler in the configuration, um, where we set least allocated, Kubernetes also offers uh, an option for most allocated scheduling. Um, in which case, in the same scenario that I just talked about, if a pod needs to be scheduled onto two nodes, if you use the most allocated scoring policy, it's going to schedule the pod onto the node with the higher utilization. And it actually turns out that the best solution for us was actually the simplest one. And this looks like a very promising candidate. So this is just an example of uh, the config file um, on how we would update this in the control Kubernetes control plane. Inside the plugin config section for the node resources fit plugin, we update the scoring strategy to use most allocated scoring, and we provide the equal weights to CPU and memory, but that can be changed based on your requirement. So let's, let's take a look at how this would look in, in our cluster. So let's say we have three nodes with ClickHouse server pods on all three of them. And if for any reason one of the pod is restarted, either due to idling, unidling, or auto-scaling. So now ClickHouse, when it tries to schedule this pod again, if it's using the most allocated scoring policy, it will first find the nodes which can fit this pod, which is node one and node three. And since node one has the higher utilization, it will then schedule the pod onto node one. And that means that node three can now be reclaimed by cluster autoscaler. And now our cluster is in a state where we only use two nodes instead of three, and the nodes are packed better. So this looks like a promising candidate. Uh, let's take a look if it satisfies all of our requirements. The first requirement was that we need to increase node utilization across the fleet. By virtue of packing higher number of pods onto lower number of nodes, we get better utilization across the fleet. The second requirement was that this needs to be low impact to the customer. When we update the scheduler scoring policy, this does not immediately trigger a restart of all the pods. Instead, over when the, in the pod life cycle, whenever the next restart occurs naturally, that's when the pod will now be scheduled onto a node which has more utilization. And the third requirement that is that our solution needs to be multi cloud friendly. And since this is a Kubernetes native solution, this applies equally to all clouds. And so all of the requirements seems to be matching for this uh, particular solution. And so, great, uh, we just need to update the Kubernetes control plane to set the scoring policy to most allocated, and we should be good, right? Well, turns out it's not so simple. In AWS and Azure, we do not have access to the Kubernetes control plane to set this particular uh, setting. GCP offers a version of this called optimized utilization that essentially does what we need it to, but this only works in GCP, and this is not portable to both AWS and Azure. 
So given this roadblock, how do we set up the most allocated scheduler policy when we're running on managed Kubernetes? Turns out, Kubernetes has a handy way of doing this. We can run a secondary scheduler that is natively supported by Kubernetes. It runs in parallel to the default cube scheduler, and we can annotate the pod to mention that it needs to be scheduled by the secondary scheduler. So what we can do is that ClickHouse server pods can be run by the secondary scheduler, and the non-ClickHouse non pods can still be run by the default scheduler. We use the upstream cube scheduler image. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, we use the upstream cube scheduler image, and we just tweak the most allocated scoring strategy. It's having some technical difficulties. I'm going to stand here. Uh, yeah, so we use the same cube scheduler with, by just tweaking the scoring uh, policy. Uh, and we deploy the scheduler in the cube na system namespace so that we can prevent evictions and scale down. So this is how we set up and set, set the scheduler up in the managed Kubernetes. So now that we have a solution that works for us and we also know how to set it up, um, I'll hand it over to Genfei to talk about how we did this rollout in a non-disruptive manner and what were the learnings and cost savings we realized. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Now we already know the answer for the problem. Just the question is how we can roll this out. So before we dive into the details, let's uh, take a look of how the rollout processes look like. We create the deployment for the secondary scheduler next to the default ones. And um, just creating that scheduler would have you know, basically a no-op, uh, but we need to update the ClickHouse pod to use this most allocated scheduler. That would be uh, just a one-time change. And from that time uh, point on, all the ClickHouse pods will start to use this most allocated scheduler. And uh, the pods will be restarted, but we have pod disruption budget configured. It's just a one-time migration. Um, for our production safety, we will start from some smaller cluster first to gain some experience. And then we gradually roll out to our entire production. And finally, after that is done, we do the evaluation and measure how much savings we achieved. All right, so for the scheduler set setup, we create the deployment of these three pods, and uh, the purpose for three pods is for the high availability. Uh, the pod itself is uh, basically the same Docker image as the upstream. We just need to update the scheduling policy. Um, we also enable the leader election. The idea is that when the primary pod crashes, the second one uh, can notice that and then take over the scheduling decisions. We actually do did some um, uh, reliability tests, basically by constantly scheduling a lot of pods, and in the middle of that, we kill the primary scheduler, and then see how the secondary ones uh, scheduler pod can take over. We find that it can just work nicely, so good to good to go. Um, we also need to do some measurements. There are two types of the measurements we need to do. The first one is the ad hoc analysis. There's a tool, open source one, called EKS Node Viewer, and that is dedicated for the EKS resource uh, analysis. This is a screenshot you can see from uh, their um, web page. There, they show the CPU and memory utilization, number of the pods running on the nodes, also even the cost for different machine type based on the uh, AWS pricing data. That comes very handy for us when you are doing some ad hoc analysis during the rollout. The other type of the measurements is uh, for after you finish the uh, rollout to the final evaluation, we need something more sophisticated than EKS node viewer. For this one, we use our internal data warehouse. 
uh, and an interesting fact that it also runs on the Clearhouse Cloud because we love our product. And this data warehouse instance will show the cost over time so we can do more comparison before and after the rollout. And the data warehouse will import the AWS cost and usage data periodically. We um, also use Superset, a super op open source software, as a UI layer on top of this data warehouse for some analytics. All right. Um, having all these measurements uh, and uh, preparation down, now it's time to roll out. As I mentioned, we start from the small cluster uh, first. Um, actually, after we roll this out to a smaller cluster, with the initial savings were not that significant. But we are not too worried, because for a cluster to run, you need to have some flat costs anyway to run your system workloads, and you also need to have one node per uh, AZ and per machine type. Those are just there, you cannot avoid. But the important part is that we gain the confidence how to operate this in our production settings so that we can proceed. So this is a uh, EKS node viewer diagram that be for a larger cluster before the rollout. Um, the important thing I want to highlight is that first, the average utilization for the cluster is around 50%, which is not very high. Also, um, the, uh, the, the utilization per node is ranging from 30 to 60%. We want to, this is something we want to improve. This is the diagram after the route. As you can see, the uh, utilization for the node uh, average has improved from 50 to 70%. And uh, during the route, we actually see what VNA just shows, a clear house pod being stopped and then be rescheduled again and to a more um, packed nodes. And by doing so for a while for the entire cluster, some nodes has been saved and the cluster autoscaler cleans them up so that that is where the 10 to 15% cost savings we achieved with this route. All right, so having done all those things for our production clusters, now time to look at the cost savings. In this diagram for our data warehouse software, the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the money that we pay for the EC2 compute machines. You can see on the right-hand side, there is a very obvious real, a dip that actually comes from our road, which is quite promising. So with all this, you may have still one question left. Well, this is very good, but uh, how does the utilization change over time? Uh, we understand that right after the rollout, when you pack the cluster, the utilization is very high. But uh, what, if, uh, as, what uh, would happen when uh, things change over time? Um, you may remember, we have service uh, being idled or stopped or terminated. All those, those processes can create, deschedule some pods from those and create some uh, holes in our VMs, something like this, which drops our utilization. Luckily, um, we have these regular uh, upgrades for our Clearhouse software, which essentially trying to update the Clearhouse server pods with the newer Docker image versions. And uh, that is, in, is done in a controlled manner and uh, gradually change one part at a time with part disruption budget. But the overall, the important thing is this basically moves the parts to the most allocated ones and achieve the same packing effect we just saw. So this to bring the utilization back to a higher point. We do this every uh, once a while for the, our upgrades. So, um, now I want to share a few findings and the issues we discovered during the rollout. I will go through them one by one. So first, system workloads. Um, we find that sometimes a event in node utilization, even, even if it's very low, the cluster autoscaler still doesn't reclaim and scale down that node. Why did that happen? Uh, after some uh, investigation, we found that nodes actually run some of our system workloads such as Argo CD controller, EBS CSI controller, all those things. And these workloads, they have 
uh, use of uh, ephemeral volumes, like a local uh, host pass or kind of storage on the node. And because of uses of that, cluster autoscaler will not be conservative, trying to not evict that part. And so which prevents the nodes being reclaimed and saving the cost. And the solution is very simple. Because we know the, the nature of these workloads uh, is OK to be disrupted and evicted. We just add the safe to evict to these system workloads. So the cluster autoscaler can then uh, reclaim those nodes. On scheduler parts, um, this is very interesting, actually. At some point, we notice that certain parts are just stuck at the dependent state. And the cluster autoscaler and the most allocated schedule we deployed have different opinion on these pending parts. Basically, our most allocated scheduler think, oh, there's no space for me to schedule this playhouse parts. It will be pending. However, cluster autoscaler also think, I don't have to scale up because you can just evict that auto over provision part with lower priority, uh, what uh, Binet just mentioned for this over provisioner. And uh, we want to figure out why this happened. So we actually took, uh, searched and found this uh, text from Kubernetes document. The summary is that when pods are created, the scheduler will form a queue and trying to schedule the pending pods. Though we are also trying to find some victim pods with lower priority to evict in order to accommodate this pod. This does ring a bell to us because it mentions the scheduler. And remember, our clearhouse uses the most allocated scheduler, right? Our over-provisioner, however, is still live at the default settings, use the default scheduler. This creates basically let two pods use different scheduler, and um, we think that may create kind of independent uh, workloads and unable to be evicted for the over-provisioner. So the solution is very simple then. We just make the over-provisioner also use the most allocated scheduler. Right after that, we see the clearhouse pod being scheduled. All right, cold start time. Um, by cold start time, I mean when the clearhouse pod being um, request from wake up from the idling or getting started in the first time, the time to take the pod being ready and ready to serve the customer request. In theory, as you can see, now the cluster is more packed. So when a new pod is coming, it's more likely to trigger a new EC2 machine being provisioned. And uh, so cold start time can increase because of the EC2 machine, node machine being set up time. And uh, we measure that and confirm that it did not happen. And we think that is because our over-provisioner buffer gives some buffer space for eviction and allows the um, pause being scheduled without provision in no time. A new node, uh, the likelihood is uh, reduced. Finally, um, as mentioned, uh, GCPs, they have a, a native option called the optimized utilization profile at the cluster level. You just enable this, which achieves the same effect. However, for Azure, it's, diff uh, it's, sim uh, it's similar to the EKS. You cannot change the control plane for this configuration. You have to do this yourself. Deploy a secondary most allocated scheduler. All right, time for the summary. So we are in a multi-tenant Kubernetes hosting environment doing a SaaS product for our customers. And our goal is to improve the resource utilization of entire for the Kubernetes clusters to save some cost. However, while doing so, we would like to minimize the disruption to our customers. We evaluate a few approach, and uh, Kubernetes, we end up selecting Kubernetes scheduler with most adequate scoring strategy. We figured out a few issues during the rollout, and that saved us 10, 15 to 20% cost, which is great. Um, some takeaway message, if you want to do something similar, we think these are helpful that um, you can uh, consider the community scheduler scoring strategy to see if there is something that you can use. Uh, the second one is to use the QoS guaranteed so, and, uh, so that if you want to avoid the noise neighbor situation. And um, the third one is that take advantage of your software uh, upgrade process so that you can uh, use the scheduling as a opportunity to improve your utilization. The last one is the uh, over-provision does uh, give you some buffer time uh, when you have a more packed cluster. All right, that's pretty much about it. And um, we also have a blog to details about how this is done in our technical blog. 
come to check it out if you are interested. Our colleague Manish, he will talk about uh, how to use Kubernetes state for that to auto scaling challenges here, just in this room. Uh, what a coincidence! Uh, tomorrow afternoon. And last but not least, we are also hiring. If you are interested in building a cloud uh, offering for the database and the uh, open source technology, come let us know. We are interested. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about the practical way to do it. You are just using the scheduler name uh, spec inside pod or any more complex or something else? Yeah, you just uh, uh, specify the pod scheduler name in the pod spec. That should match whatever you specify for your second scheduler. That should be enough. And so you're putting that on your ClickHouse uh, database pod and not on the system pod and the rest of the pod? Uh, Sorry, can you, you say that again? You discussed the fact that you wanted to keep the default scheduler for the other pod. I guess you're talking about the system pod. Oh. And uh, why, why is it, my question is more, why is it interesting to keep the default scheduler oh. for the rest of the pod? Correct. Yeah, there, there is some, the question is, do, why do we even need to have the de default scheduler for, uh, I, the, the answer is that uh, you need to explicitly opt in for our most allocated scheduler. If you are deploying some third-party event uh, deployments, for example, Grafana or those things, they, their default values still need to work. Um, and um, I guess, um, yeah, I, I guess it's just what uh, works and uh, their, their footprint is not that huge uh, anyway. So we are just keep it uh, safe and uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we haven't felt the need to use the scheduler for the other type of workloads that we're using, the main cost savings that we, that we realized, and the highest number of pods usage is for the ClickHouse server. Yep. Uh, I would like to ask if this also works in a multi-cluster environment. Does it make a difference, or really not? Uh, Multi-Kubernetes clusters? Yes. Uh, so we haven't explored that uh, exact scenario. Um, yeah. Um, our ClickHouse workloads currently is not uh, deployed in a uh, multi-cluster fashion. So every scheduling decision is done within a cluster scope. So that's not a challenge for us. Yeah, yeah I think it would depend on how scheduling works in the multi-cluster scenario. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, one, one last and then it's over time. Yes, um, I wanted to clarify um, about the secondary scheduler. Was it a controller? Or did you just redeploy the cube scheduler? Yeah, we just redeployed the cube scheduler. Uh, like, like you mentioned, it's a deployment and in which like three pods run with the same cube scheduler image and a custom scoring policy. Uh, you, you can take this mic. I, uh, I wanted to ask, um, you said you wait uh, until all your workloads or your, the uh, ClickHouse workloads are um, uh, rescheduled naturally. And uh, do you plan or know um, how you could enforce this um, automatically? So you don't have to wait until new releases are done or something. Um, do you have another controller for that or? So when you update a pod spec, uh, all the pods that, that are using that spec, uh, like when you update the scheduler to use the secondary one, it will trigger a restart automatically for all of them. In our case, we do that in a more controlled manner because we have the pod disruption budgets. We don't want to restart all of them. But if you don't care about that, you can just do it like by updating the pod spec. OK, but that sounds like you would do uh, it manually, and it's not automatically done somehow. Oh, uh, so uh, we are. We, we, our release, so first of all, our release process is done automatically. It is managed by its own automation tool, which is, um, and the second question, and the second thing is that it's not just release automation. For example, auto scaling or node drain or whatever reasons that customer change your configuration that requires restarts that we are all restart this pod and pack it to another more packed uh, nodes, which take advantage of this effect. Yeah, but we automated it like after the pod spec was done in our code base, we used the release process to automatically update it. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone.